All right. So, so the DA leader, John Stiernazen, is refusing to apologize for some of his party's election messaging. Many social media users are outraged at a controversial poster the DA in KwaZulu-Natal put up in Phoenix, north of Durban. It's a sensitive matter as there were highlighted heightened racial tensions in the area during the July unrest, with 36 deaths reported. The people who are heroes in this are the South Africans who, when the government retreated and the SAPS retreated, stood up and defended the rule of law, defended the constitution, and defended their lives and livelihoods. Those are heroes, people who stood up against the lawlessness. And I will call them heroes, and I will continue to call them heroes, because they didn't retreat in the face of danger, they didn't hide away like the SAPS and Beckett Fellows people when, when things got real. They stepped up and stepped to it. The president himself called them heroes in his own newsletter, and I concur fully with that. Anybody who stood up for the rule of law, for the constitution, which are founding principles uh, of our party, I will continue to call heroes. Mr. Stan Hazen, you, I think you are being a bit disingenuous here, because if you're saying those people who are heroes, be specific. Mm. Those who were heroes, according to the DA, were of the Indian uh, not community. Not at all. Not at all. That's yes, not yes, true. That, that's, I'm not being disingenuous at all. That is not true. They were black, white and coloured and Indian South Africans who stood on those barricades when this government retreated in the face of violence that was of their own internal making. So who are the racists in Phoenix? We're being very specific. In yes. Phoenix, who are the racists? It was, it, was, it was mainly the Indian community that actually took matters into their No, own I disagree with you. I disagree with you fundamentally. Community. There were over 300 deaths across KwaZulu-Natal. Are you going to tell me? True, Mr. There were Hazen over 300 goes... deaths across KwaZulu-Natal. Go and check your figures. No, Minister in Phoenix, we're to... being specific about Phoenix. There were 30, because that's there were, where this where the posters were, have been put up, 30, Mr. Stian Hazen, and this is why your party is being accused of being racially insensitive uh, and out of touch, Mr. Stian Hazen, for actually putting that up. If you say the ANC called them racist, who exactly did the ANC call racist? Let's be yes, racist. Let's be, let's be specific about who the ANC called racist. Let's be specific how other parties marched through Phoenix holding up posters saying that all Indians are racist. Who stereotyped that community in Phoenix? It was Becky Klele, it was Zandili Gumedi, it was Jomo Sabir, it was everyone in the ANC who, who painted that entire community with the same brush. Yes, there were vigilantes in that community and the law must take its course. That's what I'm saying. They're not my heroes. They didn't defend the rule of law. They didn't defend the constitution. They took the law into their own hands. The heroes in that situation are the South Africans who stood on the front line. And what did the ANC's response? They painted the entire community of Phoenix as racist Indians, marching down the streets holding placards saying all Indians are racist. Those people have got a lot to answer for. These are individuals and people in that community who stood up for themselves and stood up when this government let them down. The only people calling people racists were the ANC and the EFF uh, in that instance. We're saying you don't paint an entire community with the same brush. There were vigilante acts from black South Africans, there were vigilante acts from Indian South Africans, just as there were heroic acts from black South Africans as there were from Indian South Africans in that community. Right, I'm sure some of these issues are going to be picked up. So this evening, we continue our conversation on election manifestos, this time with DA leader John Stiernhazen. They'll be discussing the party's election manifesto, local government election campaign with my colleague. Uh, Stiernhazen speaks now to political editor Mzwandi Lembeje. Mzwandi, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tsepiso, and a very good uh, evening to uh, our viewers and, of course, uh, the full view viewers uh, who are watching this. And, of course, we continue with uh, the series of speaking to the leaders of uh, major political parties uh, around their issues uh, on, manif or, uh, on election manifesto. And, of course, uh, it's, uh, there have been a number of issues that have been uh, coming up. Uh, yesterday we spoke to the leader of the e EFF, so today we are speaking to the leader of the official opposition, uh, John Stian Hazen. And I just want uh, uh, to, so to uh, start uh, where perhaps uh, you, you left off. I, I, I had that clip that uh, you were just playing there. Uh, Mr. Stian Hazen had uh, uh, an interchange, uh, an exchange rather with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the reporters today. Uh, obviously these are issues around uh, the election. Uh, Mr. Stian Hazen. Um, earlier today, uh, you had um, a, an event uh, in Midrand. Uh, mm. Of course, the issue around your posters uh, came up quite strongly, mm. and uh, you stuck your guns. Mm. Here is my question. Your, your, 
mayoral candidate here in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. Dr. Mpo Palatze, has basically said that was a blind spot mm -hmm. in the city we are in. Mm. Do share her views. Uh, well, first of all, let me say thank you for the opportunity to be with you and, of course, the viewers at home this evening. Um, absolutely um, not. I don't think it's a blind spot. The DA stands up very firmly for non-racialism. It's one of our core values, and it's carried through uh, in everything we do. And I think that the, if you go back and look at the origin of this issue, it was precisely the racial scapegoating of the community of Phoenix who were targeted as, as one and against people who stood up in the retreat of law and order and the failed state to be able to protect themselves and their families. And whether that the taxi drivers who protected the malls, whether they are citizens who manned barricades, I regard them as heroes. I don't regard as heroes people who were looting and responsible for the violence and also those who were vigilantes and took the law into their own hand. And we've been very clear that we're a party that believes firmly in the rule of law and we will always uh, stand up for citizens who stand up on the side of the law. We will never defend the indefensible, uh, and we saw some of the acts there, on both sides of the looting and, of course, the, the community, where people took the law into their own hands, and that's not acceptable. I think here is what perhaps uh, uh, confuses me a little bit. Mm. We're sitting here, we are in mm. the city of Johannesburg. The person you want to run the city doesn't share your views. Mm. And this is the top brass of the of the mm. of the DA. So early on, is the house getting divided here? Well, first of all, let me just say I haven't had a chance to to speak to uh, in Port Palazzi or to interrogate. I was with her this morning. She was with me uh, on the march this morning. She was with me when I made the comments uh, to uh, your your journalist. So uh, let me be very clear as well that the top leadership of the DA and the campaign team are responsible for uh, the messaging. Uh, it may have caused some miscommunication. There may have been people who've misinterpreted it, and for that I'm sorry. But what I'm not going to be sorry for is standing up for non-racialism and standing up against the racial scapegoating. And what I find very strange is that there's all this outrage now about the poster that's gone up, but there was not equal outrage when the EFF and ANC were marching through the streets of Phoenix holding posters that said you know, racist Indians. All Phoenix people are, are bloodthirsty Indians. That's the type of racial stereotyping which I'm implacably opposed to. But certainly the people and the villains in this are the retreating state who couldn't keep people safe, which is why mm -hmm. our manifesto is a plan about how we can improve local policing because clearly the SAPS are not up to the task. And secondly, the, uh, the fact that uh, when the ANC turned around uh, through a variety of their spokespersons and called everybody in Phoenix racist, I think that's wrong. And I, I, I will, to my last breath, uh, fight against that type of racial stereotyping mm. and scapegoating. Some of the family members uh, of the people um, who were killed there have come out and said, how can the leader of the official opposition brand those mm. people heroes when we have lost our children. But, but you see, you're missing the point again. And the point is that the people who were involved in looting and the people who were involved in the acts of vigilantism where people were murdered are the villains. I've said that very clearly. They're not the heroes. I've never once called those people the heroes, whether I was on the ground in KZN when I was with many of those families and both sides and Chatsworth, Phoenix, uh, and Amaoti and Ananda. Um, I was very, very clear that we would be taking steps against it. In fact, many of those cases um, I personally raised with the station commissioner in Phoenix and the station commissioner in both police stations in Chatsworth because we want justice for those people. I will never support vigilantism, people taking the law into their own hands. What I will support is citizens who are standing up defending themselves when the government that's supposed to protect them, the state's primary duty is to keep citizens safe when they ran away and retreated and left those communities to fend for themselves. And then the ANC and EF have come around and brand all those people racist. I won't ever accept that and I'll never apologize for calling those people heroes. Do you realize the kind of outrage um, those posters are causing? That is why mm -hmm. right at the beginning I started with mm -hmm. quoting your own leader, mm -hmm. uh, the mayoral candidate mm -hmm. of, this, of this city. Do you realize that um, if people from within your ranks, mm. someone you were with the whole day today, mm. feels the way 
uh, many people are feeling. Do you realize, perhaps, well, are you able to take a step back and say, well, perhaps I need to, to, to withdraw uh, from some of the strong statement I'm making? Well, what I've this. said to you earlier is I'm very sorry for people who have misinterpreted it or you know, fell victim to the misrepresentation of what, what has been said there. That's not what was being said. Nowhere have we supported uh, the, the perpetrators of violence, either the looting and the violence, or those who took the law into their own hands. I've been very clear on that. Those people are not heroes. They are villains. They must be prosecuted. And the full extent of the law must be brought against them. And as I've said, I've taken those cases up personally with the police commissioners uh, in those stations in KwaZulu-Natal. So I think people must be very careful about not being misled or misrepresented or, 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 uh, or misinterpreting what was said there. I'm happy to concede there has been some people who have misinterpreted that. For that, I'm sorry. But what I'm not sorry for is standing up for non-racialism and standing up for those citizens who were abandoned by the government in their greatest hour of need and who had to hold point in their communities to protect their lives, to protect their community, to protect their families, and to protect their livelihoods. And these are citizens of all col colors, white, black, Indian, and colored. We saw all of those communities standing up and standing point, and I regard those people as heroes, because if they had not done what they had done, if they had not stood on those barricades and stood point, I can tell you right now, the scale of looting and destruction in KwaZulu-Natal would have been far, far worse than the 50 billion rand uh, estimated damage today and the 340 loss of lives uh, in the violence in KwaZulu-Natal. It would have been far, far worse. Mm. So I regard those people as heroes. Are you worried that this issue um, could derail your message um, in that people out there could start to receive it differently. Mm. That's why mm. I, I keep mm. making an example of mm. the mayoral candidate here in Joba. Oh. This is the city you want. Uh, earlier on, we were chatting, uh, you and I, b b before we got on, on air, you were basically saying, you're staying here, mm. because it, how important it is. This is the economic hub. But already, um, when you go to people out there, I worried that you may be sending mixed messages. No, not at all, because the, the message that we are sending out is that we have a failure at local government to keep communities safe, that the policing model currently doesn't exist, and that we've got to localize policing, we've got to strengthen metro policing to be able to fill the gaps being left by SAPS. That is the reason why lawlessness was allowed to prevail in KwaZulu-Natal, because a vacuum was created when the state and the SAPS and the police authorities exited, and what entered that space was criminality, vigilantism, and looting. And on the other side of that space were communities who stood up. What those communities need more than anything is a professional police service that has a local imperative, to be able to, and that's what's set out in our local government manifesto, how we can put 1,100 extra police officers uh, at a local level on the streets, how we can put drug un anti-drug units into communities to fight against gangsters and drugs, and not only are we talking about it, we're doing it where we govern. Maybe the final question mm. on, the, uh, on, the, on the Phoenix, mm. are you going to remove those posters given that well, to others mm. they are not uh, being received well? well are you going to remove them or are you just leaving them? Well look, they, they weren't a national decision, it wasn't part of a national decision to put those posters up, it was a very localised decision. Um, that decision is going to be made by the PEC and the, the provincial leadership in KZN and you know, I've let them know what my views and thoughts were on it, as I've shared those with you. Uh, it's up to that for them to decide. But, you know, I, I just really do believe that, you know, as I said, where there's been misinterpretation, I'm sorry for that misinterpretation. But I'm not going to apologize for standing up for people who were standing up for themselves in the communities when they were abandoned by the government. So you, you, you really are apologizing. Um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not forcing you on this one. I'm, say, I'm, I'm basically trying to say you have said you suspect misinterpretation. Um, those people who may have uh, uh, received it with that misinterpretation, well, I would say sorry are you to willing them. to? Yes, to I would say sorry to them. I, absolutely. If you've, if you've misinterpreted and you, if you think that those posters are saying that we are uh, supporting people who took the law into their own hands, that's not the case. The people we regard as heroes are the black, white, Indian, and colored South Africans who stepped in when their governments abandoned them and kept their communities and their families safe. Maybe let's just, uh, uh, on this thread, uh, not necessarily on Phoenix now, uh, on this thread. <laughs> that, that, that'll be a great relief. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, the DA, um, 
You seem to be having a great difficulty with race relations. Uh, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I know you say you are the most diverse party, mm -hmm. but uh, there is this issue of some of your leaders, uh, perhaps black leaders, it appears that uh, the environment may not be welcoming to them. Mm. We have had Musimai Mane leave, Pumzi mm -hmm. Dam, Hemen Mashaba, just mm -hmm. to name a few. Mm -hmm. So if the DA is so uh, welcoming to diversity, why would different people, high profile like this, feel it's, it's lost the direction. Well, I think that you that you you know the reasons why Mr. Maimani left. You know that the the uh, internal report that was done post the last election, and you know those circumstances. You know the volte facie that Mr. Mashaba did mm. six months before calling Helen Zilla one of the greatest South Africans and saying anyone who calls her racist is racist, and then within six months flip flopping and mm. and, and changing his tune. They've left. The DA's values and principles remain the same, which is why the Leolo Mpitis, Sivriwe Guarubes, uh, Soli Malatsis, Zach Mbeles, Gwen and Gwenyas, uh, James Masangos, Ivan Mayers, this, the, all of those people find a welcome home in the DA and they know that the DA is fighting for non-racism. They don't allow our opponents to define who and what they regard as important for South Africa or to define them as individuals. They're all excellent South Africans. They're all in positions not because they're black but because they're excellent South Africans. But I really do think that this notion of this mass exodus yeah. of black leaders out the DA is a little bit far-fetched. People come and go in politics all the time. The EFF, for instance, you got, you know, their 65 percent of their parliamentary caucus uh, you know, uh, has changed over time. People come and go in politics, but what I'm assured of is that the values and principles that have guided the DA through thick and thin over many years, through good times and bad, are the princi principles that remain. Non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a social market economy, and uh, a building a capable state. And that's what those South Africans of all colors are working towards achieving in the country. I think there was a time where DA was really growing, and particularly among all um, race groups in the country. And, um, but it was something different uh, in 2019, uh, where I think your, your support uh, dipped a bit. And then you have just said Musa Maiman uh, obviously had to leave because of the internal, um, uh, you know, that internal research you did. But since then, um, you guys have not been doing well. Um, we've had um, by-election after by-election, you've actually been losing. Um, let's just take um, last year in November. You remember after the COVID, we had about uh, 95 by-elections mm -hmm. and you lost about 11. Mm -hmm. yeah, you lost about 11. And then we had the other by-elections in December. You lost two. I know that you, you, you did gain, I think, one. And then in April, you still lost a ward. So clearly, that can't be a great indication that you're doing well. Well, I think we're doing excellently well. I think we've had a recovery. And I think there's very few parties in the world that recover as quickly when a leader just simply walks off the job uh, the way in which we had and sort of you know, leaves the party in the way that, that he did. Uh, I think that we've been able to, to pick up where we uh, you know, had fallen. To, we've had a policy conference. We've had a, a decisive leadership election that's given the DA direction and purpose. And I think it's reflected in the latest polling that, uh, that was emerged over the weekend, which shows that the DA has recovered significantly since 2019. And it's those elections that I'm confident about. Yes, there have been some troubles in by-elections, and it's mainly as a result of really macro issues that affect by-elections more than any time in a local government or general nationwide election. And these were legacy issues we were dealing with where the DA had walked away from its values and principles in the past and voters had expressed their dissatisfaction with that. The land invasions in, uh, in El Dorado Park and, uh, and River Lee and others, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the DA's uh, fudging its, its issues on non-racialism that uh, had, had repelled people who had voted for us in the past, all of those things have been rectified. The DA has a coherent policy platform. We've got a coherent message in this election that we get things done. Uh, it's an irrefutable truth that we get things done. And that is going to find huge traction with the voters. Just on the internal polling, mm. you're talking about your own internal polling? No, I'm polling. talking about the polling that was released in the yeah. papers on the weekend, which showed the DA sitting up, upwards of 22%. Yeah, yeah um, you look at, um, I, I would 
personally place uh, more emphasis on the by-elections, which would be more broadly representatives no. than, than, than internal polling, no, it's uh, not or not rather than, than, than polling. Mm. I know it's still, it's still not uh, uh, the entire picture, mm. but clearly, um, if you are able to look at the polling mm. and believe it, so you also should do the same with the by-elections. No, because as I said to you, by-elections often revolve around macro issues, particularly by-elections where there's an absence of a national campaign and there's an absence of a general message that's gone out there. So in those by-elections, let's have a look at them. Those issues, there was people that were angry in Lanasia uh, and, uh, and Eldorado Park over land invasions where the previous DA mayor had done absolutely nothing to uphold the rule of law and respect property rights. They were angry. I did door-to-door -door in that community, so I know full well the anger that they have with the DA. What you don't have in a general uh, election where all everything's up for play is those micro targets. So smaller parties and others generally do better in by-elections because they can micro focus on micro issues. What we're dealing with in our manifesto here is a plan to get local government working again in towns and cities. It is a prospectus of action, it's a record of action and a promise of more. And that's what we're taking to communities across the country saying this is what we've done where we govern this is what we can do for you because we get things done I was let me come to mm. you getting things done mm. um, because there is context to this mm. uh, you in 2016 you were given the opportunity to take charge mm. of I think four municipalities metros mm. um, Tswane, Johannesburg uh, Nelson Mandela and of course uh, Cape Town um, you have just said you get things done mm. I can tell you now, if you were to walk to people of Haman's Kral mm -hmm. and tell them we get things done, they will yes. say no because they have had no water, mm -hmm. but you've been in power for the past five yeah. years. Well, look, let's be honest. Uh, first of all, we inherited, when we took over that government, a massive mess with, with Haman's Kral and the, the sewage treatment works. There's been more advancement under the DA government, uh, minority government, than over the previous government uh, that was in charge in Chwane, and we're far for the wrong. And Lindiwe Sisulu is so was so happy with the progress that had been made that she agreed to fund phase three. So that that problem will be will be rectified. But I want to make this point that, and if you read the manifesto, it says yeah. where we where we govern and where we govern with a majority, we can get things done. Chwane and Joburg and to a degree in Elsmond Bay, were very unstable coalitions. We did not have a majority there. Chwane today is still run as a minority government. And that's the pitch we're making to voters in this election, that you've seen the instability, you've seen the fact that it's the slower pace of service delivery when you've got this instability in these coalitions. Rather give us a majority for the next five years so that we can really show you we get things done. But who do you attribute that instability to? Well, it's the fact that you've got, you've got so many different parties with their hands on the steering wheel. Obviously, when you've got your own majority and you're in government, like Midval in Gauteng, which is the best-run municipality in Gauteng, you're able to direct your policies, you're able to make sure things happen on the ground. It's a lot harder when you're in a minority government and be having to have a number of, yeah. of hands no, on the I steering just, wheel. I just want this, mm. the, you're speaking about mm. instability, mm. and I'm saying in Swane, who do you attribute this instability to? The ANC has been largely responsible for the instability, including the provincial government, and that was proved this mm. week when the Constitutional Court ruled unlawful their meddling in the Chwane, trying to interfere in the, in, in the council and trying to get into power through the back door, pushing us out of power, putting in administrators who've robbed the municipality blind and set the city's progress back. But we've had three DA mayors in Tswane. Yes. Is that the ANC, the DA mayors, three? in five years. Yes. Well, Mr. Mzamanga went to become the premier candidate, and I think that's his right to seek elected office, and he is the Gauteng leader. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Mokhalapa was involved in behavior that was not becoming of his office, and we removed him. Uh, we, we're not like the ANC who just keep people in office when, when they do wrong. We removed him. We now have Randall in place, and, uh, and Randall Williams is doing an excellent job, and that's why he's the mayoral candidate. But it's not been easy in Chwane. It's not been easy. We've had a very difficult situation trying to run a minority government with the specter of the provincial government that's continuously on the back trying to undermine the municipality, trying to prevent the DA government from delivering and then trying its illegitimate power grab which significantly destabilized uh, that municipality. In Gauteng you started in 2016 having mm. a mayor. There's no DA mayor today. Yes there is a DA mayor in Gauteng. We've got a number of them. No, 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 I'm talking about Johannesburg, sorry. Johannesburg. Uh, 
Yes, Turns we don't have one because Herman Mashaba walked out and handed the city back to the ANC. We didn't want him to leave. We didn't force him to leave. He walked out the door, walked off the job, and handed the city to the ANC. And that's why I think voters need to think very, very carefully yeah. in this next election about you know, who sticks with them when the going gets tough. Who's got the plan to get things done? And I think that it's very clear but to the DA. There's something you've just said now. Mm. Earlier you said uh, him and Mashaba uh, talking about El Dorado Park. Mm -hmm. You said um, um, the previous DA mayor mm. who didn't enforce the laws, so mm. something like that. You've just said now you didn't want him to leave. So you did not want someone who did not mm. do what it's supposed to do? Well, we to certainly do. didn't want to hand the municipality back to the ANC because essentially it's like throwing the people of Johannesburg back to the very wolves who've been devouring them for the last uh, uh, 25 years. I, I would very much like to have seen Johannesburg remain in the hands of the opposition so that we could continue to uh, with the progress that, that had been made. And so that is why I didn't want the city to be handed back. But Mr. Mashaba made his decision. He must live with that decision. We're going out to get a majority. We would like to see uh, a DA mayor in Joburg again. We believe we made significant progress in the short time that we were in government there. And we'd like to get a five-year runway to be able to really show Johannesburg what we can do, like we've done in Midval, like we've done in the city of Cape Town, like we've done in the Kocha municipality and okay. other places where we govern. Uh, we'll, we're going to go to those mm. places you're mentioning. Mm. Are you scared of Mashaba? Not at all. He doesn't have a path to victory. Uh, what is there to be scared of? Uh, the, the, I'll tell you what worries me about Action SA. But first of all, there's no path to victory. He said he won't do a deal with the ANC, um, which means that you know the EFF and him have got to get 51%. That's not going to happen. Uh, secondly, you know, if there's a, he's going to, wants to do a deal with the DA, we're going to be far bigger bigger party than he is uh, in terms of this election. And, and every poll and every uh, you know pundit will tell you that. Why on earth would we make him the mayor when when we've got a, uh, more DA councillors? So mm. there's no path to victory there. Uh, what does worry me is that what Action SA are doing is not going after the ANC. They're cannibalising opposition votes. They're trying to be in opposition to the opposition. And what they could very well end up doing is actually then opening the doors for the ANC to come in and win because a split opposition is no opposition at all. You've basically answered me. I said, are you, are you worried? I was scared of my shower. You said no, but your answer said yes. I'm not scared of him. <laughs> I'm not scared of him. I, you know, he's a, he's a political, political newbie. I'm worried for the people of Joburg that what's going to happen if the opposition vote gets split because he's going after opposition voters, not ANC voters. It would be great if he was going after the ANC, mm -hmm. fighting them, had tooth and nail in their wards. He's not. His main campaign focus is on fighting the DA, being in opposition to the opposition. And what's going to happen is that he's going to then force us to uh, be fighting on two fronts, which means we can't take the fight to the ANC full ball like we'd like to be doing. And I'm worried for Joburg's future if the ANC remain in power. Patriotic Alliance, mm. they've taken a couple of wards from you here in Johannesburg. Um, clearly, they should be a ward, and they are contesting in Cape Town, mm -hmm. your stronghold. Mm -hmm. um, and I think almost everywhere where you probably think you have um, mm -hmm. a stronghold. So does it worry you that uh, a new party is, is eating your base, mm. so to speak? Well, look, I mean, I think that we've got to accept it's a worldwide trend. If you look uh, across the world, as the spectre of COVID's come, as we've seen economic contractions, people retreat into, into racial lagers. And I think that they've been able to, like parties in, in Europe and other places, have been able to capitalize on that through micro-targeting issues. So they were very effective in those by-elections in Johannesburg at tapping into the anger that people had that they were abandoned in the, in the, by the previous administration when there were land invasions and their property values were completely destroyed and the like. So um, yes, I think that uh, any uh, small parties that eat away at the opposition vote are a concern because they essentially you know, could make the ANC stronger. Also, what you don't want to do is with this massive fragmentation in a council where you can't form a government or the government's unstable. I think we've seen what happens when you have unstable coalitions um, over the period, and it really affects service delivery. So people must think very carefully in this election about, but it's very easy as well to find a group of people uh, who look the same, worship the same, or sound the same, mm. and whip them up against a common enemy. What the DA is trying to do is to bring people from all walks of life, 
all different races, all different regions, around a common set of values and principles to build that rational center in South African politics to keep the radical socialists out of power and South Africa being put on the fast forward to Venezuela or Zimbabwe. Are you familiar with the uh, informal settlement? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, is that the one in where Midvale? Where is that? Yes, it's in Midvale. I was there on, on Sunday. Are mm. you happy with the conditions of the people there? Well, I certainly think they're a lot better than, uh, than anything. You don't, what you don't want to do is, is say that you're happy with the status quo. And that's what our manifesto says, a record of action and a promise of more. You don't want to be the best band on the Titanic. And whilst we've done well in places like Midvale, we want to do better. We've got to do better. I think that if one looks at the beautiful facility in, uh, in, um, in that particular township where we launched our Midval mayoral uh, campaign, it's a wonderful facility. There's combi courts, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, sports fields there, there's a clinic on site. Uh, are, is is um, Sechelo Setreka township the Garden of Eden? No. But is it certainly better than Imfuleni and the township of Imfuleni that are sitting right next door in, uh, in, in, in that particular badly run municipality? It's like the difference between night and day. There's no sewage running down the streets in, in Sicello. There's sewage all over the Imfuleni municipality. And that is the DA difference because we get things done. In Midval, Imfuleni doesn't get things done. You, you've been touting Midval as the best run city, mm. and I think uh, municipal, mm. uh, municipality. And I think, um, I think the Auditor General, in terms of uh, uh, the ratings, uh, perhaps agrees. But I think that's on the books. That's why I asked the question to say, are you happy with mm. On the ground, the fact that you still have informal settlement, and then Midval has a surplus. Where does that money go but to? Who does it service? Yeah, but you see, the thing is that you're going to have informal settlements in every urban centre in South Africa because municipalities around South Africa have started to collapse and Midvale's not immune to that. So yes, you're going to get informal settlements through the rapid rate of urbanisation. There is a finite budget. Housing is actually a provincial and national government function, but municipalities have to increasingly step in to do it. So where the municipality has been very good is in making sure that people have the services there. And it's not just on paper. I think that's very unfair analysis. Yeah. Uh, look at Ratings Africa. Look at the household access to basic services. Midvale stands out miles ahead he, of anything else in the country. Here's the point I'm trying mm. to, to drive, uh, Mr. Stenhazen, mm. is that as much as you talk about Midval doing well, mm. and then they have surplus, so which, which should be loaded? Why is some of the money not servicing the poorest of the poor there? You can't say uh, because uh, doesn't have, let's say, r r running storage, mm -hmm. uh, it's better than uh, the next door informal settlement. The fact of the matter uh, to live in, a hum in an informal settlement mm -hmm. is inhumane. Exactly, exactly, which is why you've got to ask yourself, why is the provincial government and national government not delivering houses to people? Why are municipalities having to step into the gap to fill that space. And I disagree with you fundamentally that, that you can't compare. You can compare what's going on in Mpfuleni with what's going on in Midval because the municipalities are right next door to each other. They have the same economic constraints. They've got the same geographic constraints. Why is Midval, by every measure, even government's own measures, not just my imagination or the Auditor General's books, by every measure, even counting government's own measure, Bongani Beloy's municipality in Midval is head and shoulders above anything else in the entire province. And it's because of good governance. And it's because, yes, sometimes you have to have a surplus because you've got to be able to plan ahead and commit that to ongoing infrastructure. I'd much rather have a surplus than have the huge deficit that places like Infolinia where they can't now deliver any services whatsoever. That money may be sitting in surplus, but it doesn't mean it's not committed for infrastructure rollout, electricity rollout, um, uh, wastewater rollout. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, the, if, the, if there was a problem with that surplus, surely then the Auditor General would have flagged it and said, this is a problem. He hasn't. He said, this is a municipality that manages its finances prudently and in the best interests of its residents, which is why I'm giving it a clean audit. Let's talk about Kailich in Cape Town. Um, I mean, you and I have been there. When I am in Kailicha, I don't see any difference between Kailicha and, for example, uh, Gatli Hong. I fundamentally disagree with you. And, and also, again, on, on every single measure. Uh, household access to basic Mr. services. Mr. Mm. The, the, the informal settlement there, 
some of the the the, 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 the water in, in uh, on, on on the streets mm. uh, people crime and all those things so so are you talking about informal settlements? I, I, I'm talking about areas mm. in Kailich. Mm. Mm. Okay, well you've, you've, you've basically said mm. you get things done. Mm. Sure. Let's, let's talk about crime. I think that's a good crime, idea. Let's talk, let's talk about crime because I think that's a very good okay, point to make. Before, before you go to crime. No, no, but I want to talk about crime. We will mm. talk about crime. Okay. But let's talk about the conditions of the people in the townships. Mm. Uh, the, the, the conditions of the people in the townships in Cape Town are not different from the people in KZN, in Limpombo, in, 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 in Gauteng. Mm. So, which basically calls into question of you, where you govern, you get things done. Mm. So, the view is that, yes, you may get things done, but it would appear for a certain grouping. That is completely not true. And if you have a look at every single one of the metrics, it completely disproves the, the theory that you've just put forward. 40% uh, of, of, of the city of Cape Town's houses have access to free basic services. That's many, many points higher than any other municipality. Just this, and I, I fundamentally disagree that there's no difference between them. Just this last weekend, I was d here in Ekoleni, down the road at Lindalani, which has been there for 20 years. There's no electricity, there's no running water, and there's no sewage reticulation. In the majority of Kailicha, and where it's not on private land, and where there haven't been land invasions that have really set things back, there's electricity, there's water, there's sanitation, there's a clinic within walking distance of every single resident, there are metro police services that have to step in because the lowest police to population ratios uh, of the SAPS are in places like Kailicha where the national government and Minister Pele refuse to capacitate those stations despite the fact that they, uh, they have the lowest number of, of police officers there, which is why there's a crime problem. Now what have we done? We haven't sat back and said, well, housing is a, is a, is a provincial national competence. We haven't sat back and said, well, policing is a national competence. What have we done? And if you read the manifesto, you will see very clearly, we've stepped into the gap where national government is failing and municipalities are going to have to do that more and more. 1,100 new metro police on the street. The LEAP program in, uh, in Kailicha, Guguletu, Bontiubel and others where the municipality is now paying for personnel. And any one of those brigadiers there will tell you that the LEAP program has probably had one of the biggest single impacts on, on bringing crime figures down in those areas. That is a DA initiative. Capacitating neighborhood watches, the walking bus system uh, championed by the city council. These things are all actively out there fighting crime, doing things that the national government should be doing but aren't, but we're having to step into the gap and get things done there. When last were you in Imizamoyeto? I've been in Imizamoyeto a number of times, yes. So what do you think of conditions there? They're not good, and, and you know, they're, they're not good because... Where is Imizamoyeto? It's, it's just on the outside of Hout Bay. I, I know it very, very well. Cape Town, right? Yes, absolutely. It's not good. But uh, the point I keep making to you is that We've got informal settlements in every urban center in South Africa. In fact, we've got informal settlements in nearly every single <laughs> urban center in Africa. It's not something that's unique to Cape Town or unique to South Africa. Is it acceptable, though? It's not acceptable, which is why we've said we've got to do more. Our, rec our, our manifesto says very clearly it's a record of action. It's a promise of more. We've got to spend more on infrastructure. We've got to spend more on rolling out. It's very difficult for the city to keep, any city, to keep up with the rapid rate of urbanization that's taking place as municipalities and uh, rural areas just collapse under the weight of no service delivery and people come to access those services in the urban centers like Cape Town. It's not good enough. I said to you, we want to do better. We don't want to be the best band on the Titanic. We want to take Cape Town from being not only the best metro in South Africa, we want to be the best metro in the continent and one of the best metros in the world. And not only for Cape Town, wherever we've been given a majority to be able to govern, we want to turn that place into something far better than what we find. From what I'm hearing, you may not be a fan of coalitions, are you? I'm a fan of having our own majorities and being able to implement things properly. If you look back at what happened in Cape Town, eight-party coalition, it was yeah. only when the DA really got into the driving seat that we were able to turn that municipality mm -hmm. around and make it the best run metro in the country that it is today. I'm not opposed to coalitions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to look at coalitions, but I think it's, you don't go out in an election to fight for second or third place. You go out to, to win the tournament. And that's the mission of the DA at the moment, to go out and win in as many centers of power as possible and to liberate those people from another five years of failed anti-government mm. with a government that's gonna get things done for them. 
So clearly where there are coalitions, you, I think your instability just comes up. I'm just reminded of Nelson Mandela again. Um, you started with a different mayor. You have a different mayor now. And uh, clearly you, you are not able to, 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 to hold on to coalitions, right? In the event you are forced into a coalition, Mm -hmm. Who is it that you simply will not walk into the coalition with? Well, I think it's about the, the values and principles that you would walk into a coalition with. I think you, you've got to look at it from that perspective because go back to the first principle. So we will be willing to work with any party that shares the values of non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a capable state where appointments are based on merit and you're able to build a municipal infrastructure and, and administration that's going to serve the people and not the politicians, and a market-friendly uh, economy that attracts investment and creates jobs and lots of them. If you agree on those four things, I'm willing to sit around the table and break bread with you. Yeah. If you don't uh, believe in those four things, it's going to be very, very difficult. And we've seen what happened when we tried to work with parties who don't necessarily share your values and principles. I know you've worked with EFF before, and of course I know um, within your party there have been those who basically said, maybe we should never have worked with this. Are you considering EFF, EFF um, going forward? Well, I don't think they, they, they meet two of, the f of, the, of those four requirements, at, at the very least. They don't believe in non-racialism. They drive a very uh, narrow race agenda, as we saw in Phoenix when they were carrying posters saying all Indians are racist and calling all Phoenix people bloodthirsty Indians. And um, I, they don't believe in, in, in being a market-friendly environment where you're actually attracting investment. They believe that the state should control everything. They want to insource everything. They want uh, the municipality to bear the costs and be uh, the, the alpha and the omega for everything. Uh, so I think it would be difficult to go into a coalition if we're starting on a principled basis mm -hmm. with parties who don't share those values and principles. The and there's one worse thing you can do than winning yeah. a municipality is winning and governing badly. I'd rather be a very good opposition in a municipality than be a bad government. The ANC? Well, if they, as they, it's very hard to work out what they, what they, they say they believe in non-racialism, but when you see the way that uh, Becky Kele and others behaved around the Phoenix issue, uh, I, I really do doubt whether it's something that's internalized. They don't believe in respect for the rule of law and the constitution, as we've seen numerous times and has been emerged during the Zondo Commission. Um, but it, we'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and see what is it that that coalition will achieve. We don't want to be in government for government's sake. So you would, you would take a step back, are the values and principles there? Then you look at, do we have commonality about what we want to achieve mm -hmm. over the five-year period? And then what are the red lines? No interference in tenders, merit-based appointments, mm -hmm. making sure that, that we fight against corruption. Then we can start to talk. But you, 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 you've you, come out, in fact, on SAPC, mm -hmm. saying uh, you can work with President Ramaphosa. That is the leader of mm -hmm. the ANC. But now you're basically mm -hmm. saying you're not sure. What I've, said, what what I've yeah. said on SABC, uh, and you know, I encourage people to go back and look at the interview, I thought it was a very good interview actually, um, is that we've got to build a rational center in South Africa to keep the country from sliding towards radical socialism uh, that's practiced by the EFF and the RET faction of the ANC. So yes, I'm willing to work with any South African, including President Ramaphosa, uh, who wants to build that rational center to be a bulwark against us being put on the, on the FOSS train to, to Venezuela. And if that means, you know, working together at the center. And I think that it doesn't necessarily have to be in coalition. We saw recently with the vote on the public protector in parliament, mm. how the rational center can work. So you had the DA, elements of the ANC, and other opposition parties winning a vote over the RET faction in the ANC, the EFF, and, and some of the other smaller parties. A decision made in the best interest of the country. And I think that we're going to come to a time, because our country is in such deep crisis, where we're going to have to put aside some of the uh, petty ideologies that separate us and join hands around common values and principles to start to build that rational center in South African politics to build on the future. So from what I'm deducing from what you're saying is that you are amenable to working with the ANC? I'm amenable to working with anybody who shares those core values and principles. If the ANC share those four values and principles, I'm willing to talk to them. If the EFF suddenly, you know, walk a Damascene road and 
and, and, and see the light and agree on those four principles, I'll sit around a table with them. But what I'm not prepared to do is to get into conversations with people who don't share those values and principles. People like Didi Mabuza, people like Ace Magashule, uh, people like Mulusi Gagaba. Uh, those people I don't want to be involved with because they've been responsible for wrecking the country and I don't want to do business with them. There are people within the ANC and elements of the ANC that I think do believe in those four things. I think there's people in all parties wearing different t-shirts at the moment who do believe in those four things. Our job is to reach out and find those people, join hands with them at the rational center. I think you've just mentioned the NEC members. Mm -hmm. President Ramaphosa leads the NEC. The decisions he takes mm -hmm. are informed by some of those people. Mm -hmm. But you said you are, you are willing to work with President Ramaphosa. That's a bit I said to you I'm willing to work with anybody who shares those four core values and principles. Um, if Mr. Ramaphosa leads an organization that shares those four values and principles, I will talk to them. If any party, if, as I said to you, even at the UVIP, if, if Gates the and McKay... If the deputy president shares those? Well, he does not share those, and that's the thing. He absolutely does not share those values and principles. Have you and engaged so him? Have you said down seen very No, but his, but his behavior shows you that. You don't believe in a capable state if you do what you did, what he did in Mpumalanga. Thanks to his reign in Mpumalanga now, it is the lowest adult literacy rate in the country. The, the province was robbed blind. There's been a cesspool of corruption there. That's not how you build a capable state, which is one of those four key pillars around which we have to find each other as South Africans to start building that shared future. It is the only way out. The alternatives are a slow burn towards irrelevance and, and bailout like we are currently on. The al other alternative is that we end up in a in a social socialist uh, Marxist uh, nightmare that puts them all we can come together and find each other on the things that unite us and build that new center. I, I think Mr. Stein is we're running out of time. What a pity. Uh, you'll, <laughs> have to, you'll have to have me back. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you take advice from former leaders, your former leaders? Yes, of course I take advice from former leaders. Uh, I, I take advice from, from a number of people. Is, uh, is Musa one of them? I think, I think you would know that that's not the truth. I think that's a mischievous question. So <laughs> you know the answer to that. He's not a member of the organization. He's doing his own thing. And okay. No, it's fine. And best of luck to uh, him. Uh, fair. Mm. But in the past few days, um, your former high-profile member, uh, Pumzil Van Dam, has really been having a serious Twitter war with you guys in the DA. Mm. Um, what is the problem? What have you done to her? She's not a member of my party. Yes. She's not a public representative. She's not my problem. And she's a former member of the DA. She's not my problem. Uh, she, she's a private citizen in, in another part of the world. Mm. She must do what she thinks is right. Mm. I'm doing what I think is right. But I think there's something she wrote, and I think we can't simply ignore it. Um, she said, you are busy with me, and then you are left with 25 days. So basically suggesting that she could unleash well, whatever. So I said to you, you know, and I find this very odd. The president is never asked to explain Carl Niehaus's tweets. And here I am having to explain tweets that you're, that you're going through. No. She's a private citizen. There are thousands of private citizens on Twitter, hundreds of thousands. Their views and opinions are their own. I'm focusing on the DA. I, I, I'm, I'm really not interested in anything. She, she's got not a member of my party. She's not a public representative of the party. And she's not my problem. And I don't know why the media keep insisting on, on trying to make her my problem. I think one of the reasons we are really, um, I mean, she, she, she basically alluded to really being, mistreat, being mistreated. And I don't think uh, it's fair. And you know uh, how South Africa uh, would protect, I mean, women, for example. And then if she comes out, and then we can't simply ignore simply because she's not a member of the party. And by the way, she is your former member, very high profile person, mm. and very engaging. So. Clearly, we can't simply uh, walk away from well, what she says. Well, if you would like to engage her, that's, that's your business. It's, I'm focusing on an election campaign. As I said, she's not a member of my party. She's not a public representative of the party, and she's not my problem. Okay. <laughs> Before we close, there is um, a, a, a party in the Western Cape, I think Cape Independence Party. Mm. They basically have called for a referendum in the Western Cape. What's your view? Well, we don't support Cape Independence, if that's what you're trying to ask me in a roundabout way. Yeah, I no, no, no. But do you support the referendum? I support 
the concept of referendums, which is why we've tabled a bill in Parliament that will allow for provincial referendums. Our constitution and our provincial legislation refers to this, but there's no legislation to flesh it out. I think that pr uh, provincial governments mm -hmm. should have the power to call referendums. It's not up to me to decide what they call those referendums on. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking me about Cape Independence, let me mm -hmm. just make my point clear. Yeah. I don't believe in Cape Independence. I believe in a unitary state for South Africa. And I think that the energy and time and money that's being plowed into that would be far better spent fighting for greater subsidiarity, provincial powers, more powers for local government, because that is what... Let me just state, state to you as well, why do you not see a free KwaZulu-Natal or a Liberate Limpopo or a, you know, let's take Gauteng out of South Africa? It's because they're moribund governments. People in the Western Cape have tasted the DA's good governance. They've seen quite clearly that we get things done, and that's stirred them up. But our, our answer to them is say, well, we want to take the Western Cape now to the rest of South Africa. We don't want to uh, be a little lager on our own. And we believe that for greater provincial powers, greater powers for local government on policing, transport, health care, we can do in the Western Cape uh, anywhere else in South Africa where people give us uh, an opportunity to govern. In 15 seconds, mm. how many municipalities, uh, the bigger one, the metros, are you likely to take? Well, I, I don't know. The only poll that matters is the one on election day. I'm out fighting for every one of them. I, I'd like to make a clean sweep. Uh, but if not, we're going to sit back and look at, at what we can do there, whether we're going to form a coalition or be an excellent opposition there. But I can tell you, whatever our decision made, it will be in the made in the best interests of the people in that municipality, and they will know that the DA is getting things done for them. Thank you very much, Mr. Stian Hazen. Uh, well, time flies. Um, well, you can always have me back. I, I'm more than <laughs> happy to come back uh, for another slot if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. It's been really great. And thank you for the honest and forthright questions. It's nice <laughs> to be interrogated by a professional. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, we'll talk about that some <laughs> other time. Well, that was uh, the leader of the Democratic Alliance, uh, uh, John Steen Hazen, really speaking to us uh, about uh, uh, what they intend doing uh, should they win the majority of the municipalities in the country. Uh, you know, the 1st of November is the D Day. Zepiso? Thanks a lot for that, um, Swai. Just uh, in a quick swipe, so the DA leader saying that. Uh, Apologies for anybody who misinterpreted the uh, nature of their posters in Phoenix. Also saying that they are above uh, petty politics and they're willing to work with parties that share common ideologies. Please expect more robust discussions this time. It will be the IFP's Velenkosini Figi Khabisa tomorrow speaking on their election manifesto.